Okay, in this um, blender, I'm going to go back and try to talk about the various panels, the bottom panels here in the um, buttons, what's called buttons menu. Um, buttons uh, is, I don't know what it's like in the newest version of Blender, but I'll cover it here and I'll go through the various buttons to get let you know what each one does. And if there's one I don't understand, I'll just leave it. I might come back around to it. Um, but I know most of the interface. Um, I know most of what the buttons do inside of it. Some I've probably forgotten about. But um, I'm trying not going to go on. I'm not going to go on tangents like I'd usually do where... I get into something and I just really want to talk about something in it. I'm going to try not to do that. And it's so easy for me to do it. But um well we got why don't we start with the buttons that I've got here in render? Because um you really do need to be able to do some renderings and um so that you can see what you're doing is probably the most important part of blender to talk about um so i'll just go the, through the various buttons um picks and it will tell me what these do so let me zoom this up this interface bring it up to full full view only oh, this is 2.04 let's do 2.28 because it's more complete <gasps> popping it 2.8 uh bring it. Bring, whoops, bring it down. I don't know why I'm. I didn't eat anything. I haven't even. Um, it's. I don't know what's going on with my. With me. Uh, let's bring this up. Now, the reason why I'm covering older versions of Blender is because um, people don't really understand them, and I do. And to point out that you don't really need to know a whole lot about the newest version of Blender to really get up started. And it helps, it gives you some perspective when you understand how Blender started to know what it's supposed to be able to do even in the newest versions. And if you start with the newest version, you can just about expect to be really confused um, because um, they move the interface, they've moved all the interface around and it has been uh, manipulated by the community, by the users, the developers um, to be used for everything in the world for once. Uh, it's no longer being developed as a in-house uh, project of ton which is how blender started and uh so you have to see it from the perspective of how it started why it was the way it was and why the new versions right now tend to veer more towards not being used for in-house um, creations but uh pretty um commonly ways the other 3D applications work and it is my view of a most 3D applications that are off the shelf that cost money that people have a disposition to prefer is because they have tutorials based on the usage of those applications but a lot of those applications are directed at schools to teach people how to do 3D graphics, but from the position that all the applications really designed around the tutorials. And if you try to do anything that is acceptable in a studio, um, which Blender is really designed to be used in, is in, in a studio, you will probably shun it because it's a complex of its complexity. And you need to understand that it had the there's a reason for the features that it has, and a, and by covering an older version, because they 
um, the older version was designed to be used in a um, in a studio, uh, used in a commercial environment uh, to create content. Um, uh, by coming that from that perspective of things and in, in the interface and stuff, you can come to understand that it is designed for that environment, not for to be acceptable by a general population, which is what it's become. And when you understand it from that perspective, you understand the value of learning it um, in its original setting. And then you can come to understand what you need, what you don't need of the new version of Blender, um, because it's being, it's being, a, um, it's being, um, it's starting to really have bugs. They're putting features in it, and they're not really supporting the features. And so it's coming, it's coming to the point where Ton really. All, the only things he sees is what they're having to work on animations with. And he's he doesn't have the capacity to really manage um, the complexity that it's taking on because of all the development that's going on. And are keeping track of it or being able to have people in place to test it. So um, it is, I feel it's divert, it's, uh, it's becoming... It's it's not convert it's not converging it's diverging um, into it's it's going to get have some trouble down the road if it goes at the pace that it is becoming not like itself uh, its original features and keeping its original features it is uh, going into the territory of being um, unimportant to um, really making animations um, because the features are not there for the needs, they're there for the wants. So people want certain features, Blender's trying to be more popular to the general population, and the general population doesn't understand that there is a reason for the complexity, and there's a reason for the way things were in Blender from the beginning. And that was to be in a to be productive. It wasn't to, to pander to a general audience of how to do 3D graphics. And when you pander to an audience, you start to lose. Um, you start to lose, especially if you're. Uh, I think and I think that's the reason why for the new 2.8, he's trying to focus on um, making the interface. Um, manipulatable so that um, um, every person can work in an environment that is um, that is unique to their tastes and then he won't have to um, he won't have to maintain um, he won't have to create an environment that tries to be popular with the audience and then he can focus more on things that matter to the animation community. I mean, to the, to the ability to be productive, and um, and the, the people that we, he would otherwise pander the inf interface to, um, who just want to do cool stuff, um, but without really doing anything in particular. People who are looking to experience new things, who do the three D. Um, create the 3D objects and things of that nature that don't really want to understand the underlying properties of what 3D graphics is and that would prefer to work on the shoulders of what, it, what you know, rather than just using wizards, you know. He wants to get, I think he wants to get away from um, the people's needs to use wizards um, you know, applications that permit you to create objects without really doing much in the actual uh, manipulation of the objects. Um, and that tends to uh, appeal more to a general audience, appeals more to um, beginning users. 
it doesn't appeal to somebody that's trying to do actual work. And when you're trying to do actual work, um, there's a tool set that you expect to be there um, for the kind of work that you would do. And so the, they're, he's designing the, the 2.8 to be to um, satisfy the workflows that are needed for real work with 3D graphics as well as to pander to an audience that doesn't understand that, okay? So the original version of Blender was designed around everything that um, Tun needed, um, and that's how um, software developed inside of a company tends to go, is that as they need things, they put things in. If they don't, if they want some feature, they have to determine if they can use the existing set to create the what's needed. Um, but they have the tendency to be lazy, which is um, a attribute of a software developer, is to try to be lazy. Um, it's called lazy development. And what they really mean is not being lazy and, and being a person that doesn't, that doesn't want to... Um, create uh, create uh, interface or work. Um, what they're what you mean by lazy development is they mean looking at what exists already there and seeing that uh, seeing if their interface and what they have already can already be applied to create the kind of content that they need uh, rather than just implementing every single feature and that kind of development focuses on, um, it tends to create an interface that is applicable to everything. There's a, there's a thing, uh, there's a guy by the name of um, Dennis Ritchie who developed um, C, the programming language C, and there's a quote, and he says, um, the language should have should have the ability to do everything that is needed and anything that it doesn't do directly it should at least be possible it should be feasible to do it um, and that's the way you have to design applications whenever you're inside of a company they're going to focus more on um, what they can do with the existing tool set and if there's something they can't do they ha or can't do directly They'll try to see if they can do it indirectly through what they've already got, um, and then they have. And if they can't do it that, then they'll have to assess if it really means that much to do it. Uh, and they might go down the avenue of using something else, buying some other tool to do it. Um, but at the very, the very last scenario is they end up implementing it and putting it in the program. So that's the way. Uh, and that's to, to some of the features in Blender that existed didn't make much sense. Um, and I think that he probably put that in there because um, he would try to implement something and then it just um, it just really wouldn't be very useful. And he just laughed it in, you know. And there is that in Blender, in the older Blender. Yeah, you know. But a lot of the stuff that exists in there really tries to focus on tries to focus on uh, a environment where you've got multiple artists working on the same projects, and it actually um, it actually focuses on being productive and reducing the time that would be used elsewhere. Um, in another application because of um, because of um, min administrative tax tasks and ton understands something about the administrative tasks that a lot of uh, software developers don't understand um, because he has a perspective on how to solve problems and a lot of software development 
um, kind of goes on what already exists. It's a conservative approach. They look at what already exists and then they implement based on that rather than taking a jump into a space and saying, what, how would I do this? And, and kind of into, into the position of saying, I don't know what already exists. Well, I do know what already exists, but how can I solve this problem better by doing it different? And um, is it possible for me to implement it, to make it in such a way that it will save time? And he does that. And that's the reason why Blender is so successful, is it wasn't just only a free program. It isn't really, it didn't really come from the environment of a consumer that was disgruntled with applications and then ended up implementing something that was just like that existed. It came from the position of somebody that was trying to do something uh, purposeful to making money, um, selling content to a, to a commercial crowd. And in that, when he developed his program, um, because he wasn't developing it for an audience to sell on a shelf, um, he put in the features that needed to be there. And, um, and whenever you develop commercially for somebody else, you're going to develop from the position that um, if it doesn't make sense for the company to sell this to the user, if um, it gives the user too much flexibility, which is a concern of commercial software and the reason why I don't believe in selling software, it will, the, the features that will exist in the program um, will make it difficult for the user to do something easy when there is a solution to making it easier for the user. And the reason they do that is so that you keep buying stuff from them rather than making it for yourself. And um, commercial software does that. The other thing that commercial software does that I really dis am disgusted by, and it's it's really gotten out of control is from the position of digital rights management to the whole purpose of digital rights management, uh, EULA and, and, you know, making, making, uh, programs, giving, uh, selling programs with, uh, software licenses is that they will use their, they will use the, um, they'll take advantage of the consumer in an unnatural way as to control the market. And if they want to move the users to a different tool, they will actually stop providing software licenses to the community, to the people that would otherwise really just buy it anyhow um, if, if they ever had another platform. The way they look at it is they'll say, we want everybody to be on this platform. We don't want to support this other platform. But the, then they say, they make to the jump they to the position that um, there's no reason to support this old version. In fact, we're going to stop letting people buy it. And that's the wrong way to work things. And if I ever see that whenever I'm purchasing into a platform, if I ever even um, smell it, if it's even in their plans, if I get the feeling they're doing this, I say, fuck you. I'm not supporting this. I'm not going to support anything you make. I'm going to, I'm going to, if I even breathe and smell you anywhere in any capacity, in any software, that you ever produce or any of your organization or any of the people that are in your organization produce, I will not buy it. I go to that very extreme. And that's what happened with me in a package called Wavefront TV. When Wavefront stopped selling TV, I took the very extreme, like Ayn Rand to socialism, I took the very extreme to capitalism of their software and said, I'm going to support Blender. I'm going to push 
this platform, I'm going to make sure that every artist has the, the ability to have this tool at their disposal, such as to create a bottom. Uh, what's there's a thing in computer science called Big O, um, where you dis, you determine uh, if a function is going in the right, if it's a function is predictable, um, that it is within the area of Big O, the Big o, the top end of the func uh, Big O function determines uh, what is uh, the most expensive and the bottom is the least expected um, of the what's desired. So Blender is like the bottom line. It's like saying you have to, at least in the software industry, satisfy these features. And when Blender communicates this to the artist, what should be possible at the very least, it changes consumer opinion about what the commercial software should offer. And when the commercial software doesn't offer the, the features that are in Blender, um, it gives the consumer the, the ability to stop buying. And that's a form of communication. It's a way of communicating to commercial developers that their opinion of, um, that their capacity to, to exploit the consumers um, is it's going to fuck them, okay? And Blender is a, basically a big middle finger to the entire cons capitalistic software industry. Um, and it basically says, if you don't satisfy the requirements of, of us consumers, um, if you don't try to pander to us um, because we're paying you, um, if you don't offer your software in a, um, and you don't, um, it, you fail to even offer, even if you're not going to support a platform, you're just not going to offer access to your older versions of your programs because we come to, to understand those things. We've developed a, we've, we've developed a whole tool set around that platform. We've, become comfortable with that we're not comfortable with any of your new providings no matter where you're going to go with this market um we want to still be able to purchase older versions and when you choose to support a newer version and um that you're at complete freedom to do that but we were satisfied with something older and it is that way with a lot of people. When you become comfortable with a program, you expect it to be there for them. But whenever they uh, support the unnatural right of forcing everybody onto a new platform, um, um, just because it is their opinion that nobody's ever going to use the older package, and which is a wrong opinion, um, and it's always wrong, and I will at every avenue, if I ever f smell it, I will say, fuck you. Um, when they do that, I just, um, uh, that's just the wrong opinion. That's the wrong, they have the right to go to their new platform. They do not have the right, and we need to penalize it in the government. We need to say to commercial developers in America, we need to say to them that if you do not offer uh, adequate rights to the consumers, in these avenues, if you make decisions that are contrary to what a consumer would expect, um, you should be put into jail. You should be jailed or you should be penalized commercially um, or by the government. You should be penalized. And um, until that happens, um, I'm just going to keep supporting open source because it's... It, flies in the face of everything that a commercial software industry has developed into a, a way of controlling markets unnaturally. Um, and to give you an example, the, this happened with me. I, I'm going off on a tangent. I, I ended up not talking about the tutorial. I will come back to it. I'll do it in another tutorial. But I have to talk about this. Um, an example being of what happened... 
um, with me is I got into the, uh, using the iPad by Apple. I understand completely the reason why they have it as a as a what's called a walled garden, um, preventing you to going to using certain um, technologies with the iPad and the iPhones. Um, there is a reason for the way they do things, and it, and the it's not only makes monetary sense to them to do this, it makes um, uh, sense to protecting their users from the potential to get viruses. So whenever they provide all their technologies through the App Store, they are saying that we will try to protect you users from the potential of getting viruses off of other, off of um, fr from the world, and this is what really um, pushes um, app stores to do the to work the way they do work. Um, one of the things that really um, is aligned, it's a it's a it's a viewpoint that aligns well with trying to protect users. Um, and it and it's where I agree with the DRM to force people into using software from an app store. What I disagree with that is is not permitting you to get from other app stores, such as when you're on Android and you're on you've got an Amazon device. Amazon doesn't provide certain applications to you. They don't. They but they allow you to sideload. Um, the Google App Store, and then you can buy get stuff from the Google App Store for your Amazon, um, but it requires some extra work to do that. That's great for the Android, and that's uh, great, but there's a problem with people who use the Android um, in that they like to bring in applications that could be malicious and give them viruses. Now, coming back to the iPad, what disgusted me with Apple is when they decided to take on the attribute that I am most disgusted with DRM when it's even available, and that is at just what I said earlier. When Apple pulls support, they that that's fine. They pull support, but they stop offering the application to a crowd that so the application exists but they pull the access to it you can no longer download it i purchased garageband i expected it to be on the ipad 3 um, platform they pulled it and you can no longer use it on the ipad 3 and so i said fuck you apple i'm not buying another application from your app store this is going to fuck everybody on the platform I might get some free software, but I will never buy another application from your app store. And I'm almost to the point to where I will not buy anything from iTunes. I will not buy movies from iTunes. I did buy one, and that was Bohemian Rhapsody. It was only because I couldn't get it from anywhere else but the apps from their iTunes. But in general, they have lost me as a consumer. And I have... I have the tendency to burn the bridges with commercial software where I see fit. I will buy into a program, um, I, even if it has DRM, but whenever the company takes on the un, uh, takes on the attribute of in of forcing users to, to uh, um, obtain a new application by forcing incompatibility. Um, which Microsoft does all the time. Um, they will make it so that you're incompatible with newer versions that even when nothing changed, they force you onto another platform. Um, but the thing about Microsoft is great is they don't unnaturally force you to... Uh, they don't uh, limit you um, from using older versions of their software. And... They understand that. I think they understand that if they did that, that really would, um, they would really lose a lot of consumers, and all of the other software developers in the commercial sphere need to understand that. They also need to understand that um, um, 
when they develop technologies specific for a specific audience, um, people are going to find out. And that's what happened with the Wavefronts. My offering is they tend to develop around tutorials and not around actual use. Um, and that's the reason why you want to use Blender is because it was designed to be used. It was not in for for animation. It was designed from the point of view of somebody that's not purchasing shelf software, but developing for themselves, which is what Tun did. And that's the reason why Blender is so successful is that it was designed from the uh, from the unique perspective of making it possible to do anything you want. And Tun will tell you he is not interested in making money, which is a great attribute of what he does. Um, because he's not interested in making money, however, he is into support. He's not interested in making money from Blender and can't really do it anyhow because it's open source. Um, it forces Blender to be about the artist, not to be about um, selling and making money. And that um, making money will tend to push anything that, you know, anything that you try to make money, unless it makes monetary interest sense as long as it makes sense to them commercially they will not push they will still probably uh, give you the ability to bring in plugins and and do the things you want to do but if it doesn't make sense to them to go in that direction to offer the uh, essentials to doing uh, complex work they, um, just by being commercial software, they are, um, that you know they are going to do things in such a way as to make the software inflexible in a way that um, they, will, they will limit features um, to a, an extent so that they can offer future products to extend those features. But it does not make any sense in some cases. Uh, Microsoft makes money off of making file formats incompatible. Um, that's how they push on new versions. And sometimes they will actually remove features from um, their software in order to keep, permit them to, um, to, to support something to force the users into doing something a different way rather than using an old way. Um, because they make opinions about how people are to use things. Uh, it's just not a very good way of working. The best way is to offer people the ability to do everything they were able to do in the old version, and let them lay with that. And then when they bring up a new package, if the consumer base is not moving to it, they will know why, and they will know that they have to work a different way. They can't expect the users to accept everything they do. And if they don't succeed in doing that, um, they have to realize that they have to probably offer a different application because they've realized the plateau, their application is plateaued out to its ultimate use, um, which will happen to every application. To have an application continuing to be developed for no reason but to make money um, is actually a bad reason to keep developing. When the tool plateaus out, whenever it reaches its, its ultimate um, capacity and its essential use, they, um, um, it should be left and they should jump to a new, to something else and let people buy into that and own it, okay? Um, but the way commercial software tends to work is they tend to keep developing something past the point of its um, interest, and then they start to um, stop supporting something, which is fine, but then they force the 
consumers off the platform by no longer offering that older program and no offering the, the ability to buy it. Because, and because they, um, some people do that, um, they, will, it, they will get a big finger from the user and the users will leave them. And then they will, won't understand why it will take them time to understand that form of communication. Consumers need to understand that that is a method of communication. And they need to know that there's open source solutions that exist that will um, permit them the ability to do the things they want um, if they're willing to jump to using them. Because the reason why they want to understand open should, the reason why they should know about open source and the stuff that exists in freeware, uh, GPL, and once they understand their rights there, um, they have a vehicle by which to negotiate with con commercial developers with commercial software. They have a um, ability to communicate with them, um, at least with the ability of saying, I can already do this in open source, can you do something else, and this is what? Um, if the capital software, commercial software, doesn't want to do that, you could say as a consumer, I'm not going to use you, I'm going to use these guys over here, because they seem to be doing something better. And if those people don't, and if the whole platform just does not do it commercially, they can fall back on the open source and then they can develop features in the open source as to communicate to the commercial software development community that if they do not satisfy what the consumers want, um, they can just expect that their industry is going to go downhill and the open source is going to go above them. Okay. It's going to over, it's going to over, um, overrun them. Okay. And the open source, people in open source make money through services, through offering support to people. And it's through those services that it survives. And that's what's happened with Blender. And that's the reason why Blender has such a large user base. It goes into the millions. Uh, Blender, a uh, ton, did a back of the envelope calculation and determined that um, of Maya, the, the only, they only have somewhere in the range of 15,000 to 25,000 licenses of Maya out in the world. And it's become such because they just do not recognize consumers. Um, and they do not recognize that they need to uh, satisfy consumers first and not their own monetary needs. They have a revenue, they take a small percentage of a revenue of Autodesk and the total revenue that Autodesk makes off of guys like 3D Max and Maya and all those, those packages, it, um, what Ton was able to see from their offering uh, that they have to give their information through to um, people that buy stocks, um, from looking at their information, he was able to deduce, he could see that their total revenue for every year is $100 million. And he was able to deduce from that how many licenses they were selling of their packages. And it is dwindling. And the reason why it's dwindling is they don't understand the consumers. And I was the first consumer. They, they fucked and they pissed off. And 25 years later, 20 years later, um, I won. With Blender, I won. And they're totally fucked as a result. And I'm saying, this is why you don't mess with consumers. Because when you mess with consumers, you can just expect that somewhere down the road, you're going to fail. And it's going to affect not only you, but the entire industry. So, that's just said, and I'll put that out there. That's how I communicate. And that's how every consumer should communicate. And then you wonder, okay, how is capitalism going to survive this? Um, capitalism will do fine. They just, people need to understand with commercial software um, that when they try to 
prevent piracy with DRM that they understand that that was the reason why they used DRM is not to um, force unnatural behaviors um, on the consumers. It's really just to limit consumers from copying and distributing their software, which is fine, you know, but whenever they um, go past a point and start to see all the ways that they can uh, limit the flexibility to the user um, of the software, when they disrespect the user's capacity to purchase, when they disrespect the consumer's capacity to um, remain on a platform of software that they've developed in the past, whether they were they're going to support it or not, they need to understand that it is going to fuck them really up the ass. They are going to take it in the ass when they make that decision. I hate to give that vision of, of uh, to some degree, but I can't, um, I can't even um, express it any other way than that. And um, commercial software will survive it just, they have to understand that there is a policy by which they need to work as a business. And their executives need to understand this. Executives in general need to understand the products that their company sells and their consumer base. If they don't, they need to be um, kicked out and replaced. And um, they need to understand that it is going to affect them down the road because when you see executives vaulted from other corporations, they it really ruins their potential to move uh, as executives to other companies because the community sees these guys are not worthy of being executives. So the companies need to understand that when they bring somebody in, um, that they understand how that person got to be where they are. So anyhow, but the executives need to understand the products that they're selling and the consumer base that they've got more so than the creditors. It's okay that they understand they, they have to executives grow the company, but they have to do it by offering better products, not by, not by pulling shenanigans like firing off people to raise their stock price. It is not a good way of working as an executive. So, that side, I'm just going to drop it, top it, and I'm going to save this off and then go and work on Blender and show you more. But you need that perspective as a consumer. If you don't, um, you can just about, about expect to be exploited by this industry of commercial software. And it is unique to commercial software. It is commercial software that's doing this. Um, it's been um, the reason why GPL even exists, the GNU public license, and GNU stands for GNU is not Unix. The reason why that happened in the first place is because they just, they um, pissed off a guy called Richard Stallman, and he was put into a community on, at MIT that was in support of developing their own software, and when the executives, when the administrative people came in and said, um, we want to limit users, they said, fuck you, we already have a community of, of um, open use and development. Um, but then there's other people that decide, oh, we can turn around and sell the software and cut people off from ever using it. When that happened, he really got pissed off, and then he started to figure out a way to offer software and create that uh, basic community of giving back and being able to support um, and commercial software sees that as an unnatural ability of the community to be able to force commercial software to um, to pander to its consumers rather than to pander to its creditors, um, which is required. In the, and, and they see that and they they they've got some sort of conservative point viewpoint that everything needs to be supporting everything companies need to need the stock market and they need to, to be incorporated and they need to have all these rights that um, come about from an unnatural beginnings, unnatural ways of working. And 
consumers need to understand that a corporation is an unnatural entity that came to, uh, that came from beginnings where um, corporations took on the rights of an individual without taking on the responsibilities of an individual. And it creates a company, it creates an a organization that does not value humans. And and because it's a robot, it's you know, there's a um, um, musician, her name is um, Grace Slick, or Grace Jones, and she has a uh, great video called um, um, uh, Corporate Cannibal. Um, I think that's the name of the corporate cannibal. And it talks about in the video, she covers it and she basically says, I consume my consumers. I do not value you. I, you know, and this is what has happened to corporate incorporation. What has come of a company, what, um, companies originally were designed was to make money in a, in a fair marketplace and business people think that the marketplace is fair. And what they don't understand is it's become unfair. And because it's un- the reason why it's unfair is because the incorporation of companies has um, companies take on the attribute of having the rights of individuals without the responsibility of, of an individual. And when the company fails, nobody is held accountable. And because of that lack of accountability, it is ruining us as a country. It's the reason why our country is the way it is. It's because companies have lobbied um, the government into taking penalties off of companies so that they can exploit America. And so... Corporations are unnatural entities. The stock market is kind of an unnatural entity. It, while it still lets you buy stock in companies and supporting companies that are important, it um, is like a mirror to the company, to the corporation. The corporation becomes, um, through the through the valuing of what happens on the stock market, they become OCD, they become OCD, um, anorexics, obsessive compulses, obsessive with the stock market in determining their value in the world rather than looking at what they do and being able to jump to making progress, being progressive. They become more concerned with what happens on the stock market and it develops it grows them but it grows them unnaturally and they become they become they start taking down the attributes of the ultimate what a corporation is able to do as an individual and with none of the responsibilities of an individual and we need as a government to put back in the penalties on these corporations and really on the corporations not on the beginnings of the company because companies aren't corporations. It's when you become a corporation, when you incorporate a company, that you are saying that I am able to somewhere down the road take on the attributes of an individual without the responsibilities of an individual. And I I will lobby the government. I'll put in things into the law that, um, that pander to us and do not pander to um, people that value the people. When the people start to be in unimportant um, to our marketplace, when people become unimportant and the companies become more important because it is that way, the people, that the whole country as a whole becomes less important. And the, the corporations will move to other islands of opportunity elsewhere in the world as they have become. And people need to understand that um, the libertarians that push the idea that 
Um, did Atlas shrug? Yes, they did. They all moved to um, where is it? They in, in the Middle East. There's a, a town. Um, um, yeah, I, I forgot the name of it, but um, um, all the libertarians moved there because they're tax free and all that, and they're going to exploit it, whatever it is. But there's nothing really there to exploit because it's out in the desert. Um, but they exploit the ability to be free from any penalties that anything can produce. And corporations will always move to that um, extreme. They will never pander to a community, only unless it makes them money and it gives them great PR and, and, and something they can stick in their advertisements. But there are so many tools available to corporations uh, by which they can manipulate the consumer base and the consumers need to understand all their tools by which they work so that they can make better decisions about which products they're going to support and what corporations they're 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 going to support and what they as a consumer can do body can do to the private industry and create a fair marketplace in america um um, by penalizing the bad behavior that uh, a lot of corporations have uh, be has have exhibited. Okay, so it comes back to um, that the corporations need to understand this. People in the software industry need to understand that there are ways of working that are that are um, good to the consumer that they need to do this in order to make money and continue. And the consumers need to understand that they have a voice and the voice is open source. Um, it is the GPL and um, it was GPL that was created by GNU. It was created by Richard Stallman to um, fight a commercial industry um, of software and that um, making software commercially available is good. Uh, I can understand Bill Gates' point of view. He was pushing it from the very beginning, even in the the sphere of where Richard Stallman was at the same time. And I can understand the value of it to produ produce a microcomputer industry and is the reason why it, it does exist. And we have so much um, flexibility available to us. But open source has developed as a result of the failings of companies to um, pander to the consumers. That is one of the primary reasons open source exists. The secondary reason open source exists is to communicate, um, is to, to create plateaus of applications that, uh, that already uh, observe their real use and to per, and to force commercial development to develop new technologies um, um, where needed. And if the commercial industry can't do what the open source has already done, if the open source has ultimately um, assumed all of the all of the attributes of what consumers need, then there really is no reason to continue on with commercial development of software. Um, it's really sad that it would have to be that way, but the reality is, is that um, when that happens, you really kind of, in a way, um, not really kill off, but um, it forces um, a industry of what's called service-based industry where you're offering services to people to understand the software that already exists um companies don't want to do that software companies don't want to do that they want to offer products because with products they can um keep just reproducing the product sell it off they can do support but they can um they make lots of money exponentially and that can no longer continue in the um, 
in the computer industry because it's already developed, it's already plateaued out to its ultimate use. Um, and when we buy into new cell phones and stuff, it's okay that we get more capabilities, but we need to um, retain the value of what we've purchased and not keep buying new stuff because it is exploiting the earth, it's exploiting everything. We, we got to make decisions about why we are continuing to buy into new hardware, new software. We need to see where we can recycle and reuse, um, not reuse the technology, I mean, not put the technology in, into recycling bins and um, assimilate it into new technologies. We need to see how we can continue to reuse the existing technologies we already have and to see the value in that over getting the next thing just because. And Microsoft um, works this way. They always want to make money off products. They don't want to really offer services to people. They will offer service, but at a high cost. And it will always... Uh, be they always have the perspective of how it's um, going to cost, um, how it's going to compare with what they offer as their products. If it is not significant, they will not develop it. They will not develop their services to their technology, and their services will. It, they they figured out that if they force people in an export platform, it um, it forces people into training and it forces people to buy training and which is another industry they've got and it forces people to seek support because they're unfamiliar with the new technology and you know it it forces in a natural way in which um, software is that if it's already realized its ultimate use you can't really keep soft developing the software unless people can see a value in the stuff that um, that's developed into. If consumers don't have a voice, they don't have open source. They don't have the capacity to really make good decisions that support their environment. And that's the bottom line. If they don't have open source, they do not have a voice. They are not going to be valued as consumers. And they need to understand it just as you have rights in America to be uh, an individual, to be civil, and to have a voice and to be able to communicate. You need to have those rights in software. They, they need to translate into software. And when you get into a piece of software, they will sometimes put policies in and say, you signed to this, they, we're waiving the right to really treat you as a, as a fair, fairly as a consumer. Um, they have things like that in their, in their policies. Whenever you sign on to a new contract of how to use the software, they put stuff in there that um, gives them rights over you. And if that such things exist, you have the capacity as a consumer to say, fuck you, I'm going with open source. And open source is not going to do this to me. That's why Blender is so significant and why every artist needs to learn the software. If you don't do it, you're going to be exploited. And the commercial software industry is taking on the rights of what they can do with their DRM, with their um, software licensing, the way that they enforce people onto the platform. They will take advantage of that when they need to make money as a company and they have no other opportunity that, that makes, um, and they will not progress, they will not change. Um, they will tend to be a conservative com commercial entity that tends to um, fall back on what they know and what their um, and what the way they do the business, they will not um, change to become progressive. They will not find try to find progression. They will not innovate, and because they will not do that, 
um, they need to understand that the inability for them to innovate and make things better in the world will backfire on them and they will cease to exist. And that's fair. That's a fair marketplace. That's the bottom line of a fair marketplace is that if you do not satisfy the consumers, if you do not satisfy the needs of people in the marketplace, and you will cease to exist. And that's fair. That points, that makes companies disintegrate. The people that have the valuable skills in the company would go on to produce better companies knowing um, having uh, access in their knowledge of the what was the wrong thing to do in the company that was there that the environment didn't wasn't wasn't um, I think the words conducive to making a create create a better to produ to produce good software create good products we need to make it such that that happens because there are a lot of people that are in companies that don't have an interest in really satisfying consumers we call them sociopaths or psychopaths they are uh, and um, psychopaths will kill people but that's only if they're treated badly um, in when when they're from the beginnings uh, attribute of psychopath is they tend to value themselves more than other people and when you have those people in those manipulative people in a company and the company fails and doesn't fail that company takes on the attributes of those people and it treats people unfairly those companies need to fail they need to um, cease to exist and if they don't cease to exist, we create a whole marketplace that also takes on the attributes of those companies and is the way we are today. And um, those companies don't value other companies. They don't value the marketplace. They monopolize. And because they work this way, we, the environment, the choices we make as consumers has created this environment. And it is our failing. And we need open source to maintain our rights outside of open source as humans. We need to maintain a understanding of what exists in open source at the very least to maintain our rights as consumers and to retain our rights in the marketplace and retain our rights elsewhere. And it's also a way of being able to communicate in other areas having nothing to do with software to understand human rights okay so it is in our best interest in the country regardless of what commercial software says about socialism and things of that nature it is not socialism to support free software because the free software does not um, force on consumers an unnatural behavior of taking from them stuff that exists what the open source really does is it forces commercial developers to be fair to consumers. And the, and software, I mean, it forces commercial software to be fair to consumers. And um, if it doesn't, if if they, the companies don't understand this, if corporations don't understand this, they will fail. And that's good. That's good for us. That's good for our rights. That's good for our country for bad companies to fail and we need to understand that that is valuable to capitalism that capitalism um makes th that will make capitalism that'll make sense to cap to being capitalism that is what businesses that's what good business leaders understand that it needs to exist in the marketplace they just don't understand that we've become a our marketplace has become unfair and it's not as a result of open source as a result of how they treat consumers and how they treat each other okay so i've said that i put it out there on video hopefully people watch this video and they'll go wow um i need to be a better consumer 
I need to make decisions. I need to learn open source. I need to have realize my rights as a consumer and to um, at the very most at the very most choose better software or better products and at the very least say I'm not going to support these products I'm going to support um, anything that I can and or develop it myself create a new company okay that's um, a lot of software developers are just disgruntled consumers when they fail to see things that they need they become software developers to support that thing and they might try to make money as software developers and um, they need to understand if they ever take the position of becoming um, like these bad corporations that um, if they don't understand that they are the new bad guy um, you have to wonder if they can live with themselves as for one but um, that it is the reason why they became who they are and not in a good sense but in a bad sense they have become their own worst enemy okay so that all aside i'm just gonna leave it okay i beat the dead horse